Good day, Jake. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to allow me to record this session today so that we might share it with others. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. Before we launch into uh, your questions and my attempt to answer them, uh, could you share with us a little bit about your background in learning and development? And then maybe, you know, how did we specifically end up here today in this Zoom conversation to uh, entertain some of your questions? What can you share with us? Yeah, absolutely. So I started out my career in management consulting, and I was primarily focused in operational consulting around project management and specifically large capital construction projects. And um, I actually was not really related to L&D at all at that time. I was doing a really niche specialty called project controls, where it's basically data-driven project management. And I had some opportunities while doing that to engage with some training for clients and also for my company internally. And I found that I really found it a rewarding experience to enable people and empower them and uh, I kind of started steering my career in that direction. And about three and a half years ago with a partner, we founded our company Elevos, which is a management consultancy. And we primarily focus on um, basically L&D, but you know, um, we call it sometimes human capital management as a kind of a larger sphere of influence. Um, but I really like your focus on performance management. And I learned about your work um, I don't know exactly when, but you are just ubiqu ubiquitous on LinkedIn. So uh, I see you everywhere. I see um, all your posts and your comments, and you seemed to be bringing up some really valid points about L&D that I didn't hear a lot of people talking about. So I took an interest in you about a year ago and quietly followed from the shadows, but finally reached out a few weeks ago with some questions that I had. And that was after reading Aligning and Architecting, which really helped me get an overview of how to approach L&D. So thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. All right. So uh, without any further ado, uh, you, you shared the questions with me, but you may ask them slightly differently. So go ahead and uh, shoot. Sounds great. And um, I'll give just a little bit of context for why I'm framing these questions a certain way. Um, a lot of the type of work that I do is related to organizational change management. So helping organizations adopt new ways of working, which often changes performance expectations. Um, that could be process or system or standard implementations. And so I have a few questions for you about specifically related to those types of um, you know, L&D projects. So the first question I had was related to chapter two of your new book. And it was, what special considerations do you keep in mind when you're creating a project steering team that's related to an organizational change project? All right. So the concept of a project steering team, I borrowed this from the total quality management movement back in the 70s. And when I started uh, in L&D in late 79, I was coming across these parallel efforts, if you will, to improve performance in my language. Um, but so the project steering team has to be the stakeholders. Now it can be the requester, whoever requested uh, learning and development services um, or the head of the project. However, uh, learning and development gets their foot in the door. They need to organize their clients, their stakeholders for their success. And if, if you if you don't, you know, either you have kind of a planned approach to things or it's just all haphazard and whatever, whenever, however, um, which is no way to run a railroad or uh, an L&D project. So I think the key thing is to make sure that the stakeholders are represented. And this can be tricky because there are, if you will, geographical uh, stakeholders in different parts of the company, in different parts of the planet. Um, but there's also political stakeholders, people who, um, for whatever reasons, right or wrong, they need to be involved in your project because they have a political sway. They can sway people's thinking, uh, their acceptance or their rejection of what you're thinking about. And it's good to know where they're all coming from. And I also like to organize the project steering team in a, in a way so that they are more or less face to face. Now you can do that virtually, but but they need to hear each other 
talk and ask questions and probe and challenge and all of that and understand where they as a collective are because you're working for that collective. They are trying to get some sort of a change management effort done and learning and development can be a part of that. And so we are there to support but we need to make sure that we've got the right voices in the room. There's no, there's nothing worse than having the wrong people on the bus, so to speak, and where you get to and how you got there and what you've concluded uh, on your bus journey can be very different depending on who was involved in the first place. So I think that's the key critical consideration. That's really helpful. Thank you. And something I was considering about the structure of that team was would it be a, generally a subset of the larger team that's steering the change project? Or would you say it should include everyone? Um, well, you can't deal with everyone. I mean, the, the larger the meeting, the more uh, dysfunctional it can easily slide into. Um, so I think that you want to have, it should be a subset. If, there, if there's a committee structure in place for change management effort, as there often is, um, you want to be a sub team to that leadership team. The leadership team needs to hand pick the members so that they trust the decisions that are coming back out. They trust the people to do the work that that sub team, that subcommittee is undertaking. Um, so again, this is wiring into the politics. Who should be on this? Who should have say? How do you make sure then that it's not... Um, an approach where the stronger people, the higher level ups, you know, this is this is where the facilitator's role in running a team meeting makes sure that all voices are heard, even if they have to step on or slow down one of the stronger people in the room, one of the stronger personalities, and you may need to, you know, quiet them so that you can hear other voices bring in uh, divergent, convergent views, um, because you're really trying to generate enough data, the right kind of data, so that decisions can be made about what do we do next, and what do we do after that, and how do we do it, and, and all of that. And, and the idea of having a team is that more voices are better than one, more heads are better than one, they just take longer to get anything done. And so you have to marry the concept of a project steering team with having a strong agenda that gets you from A to Z or Z um, at the appropriate amount of time and touches all the key uh, issues, problems, and opportunities that the team must need to uh, would need to deal with. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, the next question I had was related to chapter three, which was about re-engineering some of the key L&D processes to enable alignment. And um, I set up a scenario for this because um, it's a bit of a niche question. So the scenario I had in mind is obviously one I'm familiar with, which is um, that I'm hired to lead training related to organizational change management within organizations that sometimes have immature L&D processes. Um, and possibly, you know, immature at multiple levels, you know, at, at an HR level, possibly at a functional group level as well. Um, so I wanted to know, to what degree would you re-engineer the L&D processes within the bounds of that project versus adapting to the organization's existing processes? Well, I think it's important that you adopt what you can and then adapt the rest. So... Now, you're working for a client, they have something in place. Now, either that L&D function has a minor, small role or major, significant role. This is political. So if they've been put to the side because nobody likes them or how they do things or, you know, the way they part their hair, um, then you've got to, you know, align with the power sources because you're trying to get a job done. Uh, you'll want to do this in a collaborative way with all parties, with the other L&D organization and such. But if they aren't known for certain strengths, like they've got a good process that's really quick and it does a good job. Well, if they don't have one of those, then they need to get one for this particular project and they can use this as a learning opportunity. Now, this is awfully, you know, can get dicey in dealing with the personalities on the L&D team who feel like they're being shoved in a corner and they may not like that. So you may need to learn the ways to collaborate with them. But if you've been hired to get a job done, then you get the job done. You've been hired for your approach, your processes. You can look and partner with the L&D organization to see 
what is it in their philosophies, their processes, their practices that you can use so they can have some visibility that it's not all just new stuff and their stuff was thrown away. Ideally, you'd want to be working with them because they'd want to find a better way to do things going forward in the future. And maybe this is an opportunity for them to look at that. It's difficult when you're telling uh, the internal group that you, the outsider, are the experts and, you know, we're going to force this on you and all that. Um, But if I've been hired to do a project, I am contractually, legally obligated to get it done to whatever specifications, whatever schedule I've agreed to or whatever. So I've got to be in control. I've got to use my processes that I know that are predictable for me. I know how they run. I know what their issues are. I know how to think about them because I've done them often enough. Now, I could be partnered with an L&D person who hears me thinking out loud all the time so that they can learn and ask questions by my thought processes as I wrangle with some of the uh, alternatives and options that I might have dealing with situational variables. So how I think about projects on the front end that affects my project planning and management, and then how I think about the projects as they go from stage to stage or phase to phase, that's really critical because I'm I'm worried about the next set of things and the future things, but really the next set of things, because I might uncover something in this next, next set of things that has implications to my downstream efforts, to my clients' efforts or my efforts or the collective. And so we we really need to be partnering with the right people. But if the L&D folks don't have any credibility, if their credibility is less than zero, then sometimes for the good of the project itself, you need to just plow ahead and do your thing and do it the way you know you can make it work without having to be um, questioned to death about your your approach and your method because it's different. I, I've had that happen to me several times and it's one of those judgment calls where you've got to decide, how do I handle this? And do I handle this now or do I handle this later? And and how do I just tell them this is the way it is because I'm contractually obligated? And, you know, so if you would like to work with me on this particular project, I'm happy to have you along, but I'm not going to have you taking shots at what we're doing or whatever. Um, and if it, you know, there's come a time when in a project steering team meeting, I had to take exception to what the L&D folks were saying about this because they were expressing their skepticism this was going to work and i've got a boatload of experience and was able to talk about that so their suspicions their fears uh weren't valid as far as i was concerned in terms of them being real but i could understand from a human nature that they you know wanted to have their hand in the game and 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 play a role to build their credibility so that it's a tough thing yeah I appreciate that your first instinct is to articulate your approach aloud so that uh, the the teams around you can participate in the process and can learn from it and, and engage with you, but that you're still willing to commit to the bottom line of I'm here to do this job and to complete it correctly. And I believe in this approach. And so I can't adapt it too heavily without undermining it. Well, and that's true. I mean, I've got to see if I'm going to do some plug and play where you've got a special technique and a tool or whatever, I've got to see how that plugs and plays into my process and how disruptive it might be. And of course, it could be just an improvement. It may not be very disruptive at all. It may be well worth the effort to do that. So, but normally if I'm coming into a situation, I know how I'm going to proceed and go do things. So what I would be looking for is opportunities to embrace other people, not just L&D, but HR or the quality organization or, you know, whoever's involved in corporate, you know, communications, whoever's involved in this, because we, we all have methods, we all have processes, we all have things that are kind of equivalent to our ADDI, which to me is a new product development process, but everybody's got one, how they get their thing done. You know, everybody's got a process. And so one of the things that I do when I tell my clients, I've said, I'll think out loud. I'll talk out loud. I'm not afraid to be wrong. So if I'm wrong and you find me wrong, you know, you don't get a prize. Um, I'm just thinking my way through this and I'm think doing it out loud so that others can hear me and maybe pick up on something and warn me or reinforce my thinking. 
That's really helpful. Thank you, Guy. Um, I, I had another question that came up from chapter five, which is the first phase of instructional architecture. It's the project planning and kickoff phase. And um, again, I'm thinking from the perspective of an external consultant or contractor, and I'm wondering how much of the project planning process would a consultant or contractor generally complete before requ requesting that the client commit to compensating them for continuing to support the effort? Because I, I imagine there's no clear line of demarcation when you have to kind of cut it. And I wanted to know how you approach that. So I've been doing this since 1982, November 1st, 1982. I started as a consultant and my the person I went to work for, his it was his consulting firm, a small firm. He had his approach and he would meet with clients and take their request, clarify that, and, and he would respond. Now, a lot of times there's a request for quote, a request, request for proposal, RFQs, RFPs, and somehow there's a request. And then you respond. So we would produce both a project plan and a proposal. The project plan was a draft, declared itself to be a draft. And the proposal said, uh, my pricing in this proposal and the terms and conditions and all the legalese is related to that draft project plan dated such and such. So if the client bought the draft project plan, that would be the price. So we always segregated the project plan details and that we would produce a detailed project plan. Because if you're going to spend some significant dollars, you're going to want to know how you're going to get through this. What's, you know, what's your view? And we would lay out after, you know, talking to other people, finding out what other processes or whatever did we have to intersect with and when and et cetera. Um, but we would lay out our project plan and say, here's how we're going to hit these various milestones, these review points, and get through gathering data and, and doing something with the data and creating products. You know, this is the plan going forward, and here's the schedule for that. And here's the key meetings so everybody can check their calendar to make sure that they're available or move their dates around or we'll move our date around. You know, so let's work together here and create a, a cohesive plan. So I would deliver that, and if my client accepted it, then they're on the hook. Now, the, the payment schedule that I put together always related to my phases. My first phase, and you alluded to it, is project planning and kickoff. No matter what I'm doing, the very first phase is project planning and kickoff. Because I can create a, a project plan and a proposal, give that to you. Your contracting organization can send me a contract. And I can sign it. We can all be ready. Go and start. And then we meet with the project steering team and they say, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense because of this other thing going on. You know, I would change that one part of your project because that ain't going to work. So, but I got my foot in the door, I have the contract and I've started to charge my client for my time once they accept the contract, which is usually somewhere in that first phase when I'm doing intake, do the project plan, then depending on the client's organization and their contracting process and their rules that they live by, you know, we either have a deal and then we start the work. I I have done entire projects before I got a legal contract because they were my clients. I've been doing business with them for years. They were in a bind. They were in a hurry. They couldn't wait for their legal and contracting groups to get their act together. So I just did it. And so sometimes you do that. So it depends on the relationship. But by and large, if you produce a project plan with some detail in it, that's you gave that to them for free. But if they want you to carry that forward, now other people could say, well, you gave it to them. Now they can go do that. Well, not necessarily. It says what to do. It didn't say necessarily how to do it and give all the nuances about, you know, how do you actually make that work in that time frame that's been established? So this is a tricky thing for consultants is, you know, pricing their projects, pricing their time, you know, because you're either doing things time and expense, you know, I'll send you an invoice at the end of the month or every month, and or it's fixed fee. Now, my preference was to do work fixed fee unless I couldn't see how I could plan my way through and get this done. There were too many variables, too many soft spots in what the client was doing, no hard dates or whatever. So there was nothing for me to tie to so that I would say, well, this one is, you know, one of those hairy projects that, you know, you know, don't know what's going to happen. I'll do it for you. 
but I'll do a time and expense. Here's my rates. Here's my best estimates of what it's going to take to go do the analysis, the design, the development, or whatever, and give them some idea because it's like taking your car into the auto mechanic and they say, well, we think it's going to be, you know, a $150 repair bill and you go in and it's $1,200. No one likes that. So I'd rather tell a client that it's going to be 300 when I think it's going to be 150 and come within that. But but estimating is a tricky thing. Uh, different company cultures think about estimates differently. They think that's a really hard estimate or that's a really soft estimate. And so I've learned because I've been burned uh, about asking questions ab about that when, I, when I'm doing that kind of work about how they want me to propose this time and expense, fixed fee. Oh, you like fixed fee? Yeah, me too. It means that we agree on everything that's going to be done and there's no extras. There's no change orders. You know, I've been in business 40 some years. I've never done a change order on a project because I worked really hard to make sure that I got a detailed plan accepted to by the clients. And then we went from there. I uh, have a lot of admiration that you are willing to put fixed fees on projects because I think it speaks to the rigor of your approach and your understanding of the scope of work before you sign the deal, which uh, I think a lot of us could learn from. And, you know, it's perhaps those in the construction industry as well, you know, they're rife with change orders, you know, blowing projects triple their original budget. Yeah. Uh, so I really respect the lack of change orders. Thank you. Um, I had one last formal question, and I've kind of thought of a couple more along the way. But okay. um, the last chapter from which I thought of uh, a question I wanted to send to you was chapter six, which was about the analysis phase of instructional architecture. And uh, again, this is sort of a scenario. Um, imagine that, um, you know, I have a client who requests training to address some related performance gaps among several interdependent roles. Um, you know, perhaps um, several roles within a function of the organization, and they don't have a clear understanding of where the performance gaps currently lie distributed amongst those roles. And, you know, assuming, of course, that we want to prioritize the most critical gaps, would you generally complete an instructional architecture process for each role in parallel at the same time? Or would you kind of parse them out in series? Well, I think the, the I don't start with the job title. I may get that. That's how it may be started. Somebody comes and says, hey, I need some training for this job title. But I want to know, what, you know, so I'll politely listen, do my best active listening, and then I'll somehow find a way to segue to performance. So, well, that's interesting. So what would practice with feedback look like that, that's authentic? It looks like that on the job. You know, what are they going to expect to be doing back on the job? And we're going to have them practice that in the training session or learning session. And and so I'm always trying to to shift um, that. So I'm starting with the pro so if these people are all in the same process or a string of processes, it's one of the things. Uh, processes are quite arbitrary as to where they start and end, and your view of that is different than mine. But it's it is one elephant, you know, and you can divide it into thirds, and I can divide it into thirds, and and uh, you know you've done you know horizontal cuts, and I've done vertical cuts. So the middle is kind of the same, but not exactly. And, and so one of the things to do is I try to focus on these are the target audiences that make sense for me to understand that. What is their performance? And so I need to, if I can sense, if I can find out uh, early that these people are all in the same process and there's gaps in the, but we don't know who's doing what and, you know, who's at fault, so to speak. So I would do them all in one project. And it's really about process performance, and then the enabling knowledge and skills. And if I know task by tasks who's involved, I can make sure that the training addresses, you know, when you're doing this, you know, there's this other role, they'll be doing this other part. You don't have to do that. They'll be doing it. Here's how you can tell whether they did good or not. And then you can proceed, you know, whatever I need to teach the individual performers as they play their role in a described process and a defined process. Um, so oftentimes we've done the analysis to figure out, so what is the process? Because the client, the requester, they don't know, you know, they're three levels removed from that stuff. And they, you know, they, they came up through the ranks, but not in that, you know, area of the operations, you know? So 
So uh, they most of the time, my clients may think they know, they think they should know, and they think that they need to tell me so that I know that they know, but I know they don't. They don't know. They know they have some clue as to what the performance is all about, but they don't understand the nuances, which is why we want to talk to, we'll listen to them, hear what they have to say, and then ask to speak to master performers or exemplars or top performers, star performers, whatever your organization calls them. And because you want to talk to the people who are actually getting the job done now today. And they know what the barriers are to performance. If they even think about them anymore, they may have forgotten about those barriers. They handle them every single day. But if you ask them, make a list of them, they couldn't tell you because it's just been automated in terms of how they go about doing this work. And so our goal is to understand what is the process? What's the appropriate way of doing it? Where are there more than you know, one way to do it right, and it's acceptable, then which way are we going to train new people? You know, if there's three ways to do this one part, you know, which way do we start them on? Because we can't teach them all three ways all at once. So, so I think that that's, you're, you're looking to do that analysis across the seven roles or a number of roles, whatever they are, across the process. And if there are other players in other processes that produce things that infeed into our core process, then we may want to look at them separately. So I like to, when I'm doing analysis with a team of master performers and other subject matter experts, I want us to be talking about what they do for a living most of the time. I don't want the majority of the meeting to be on some other part of the job that they have no business in there and that we're boring them to death and wasting their time. And so but I also like to hear, to have people in the room who can say, oh, that's what you're doing before you give that to me? Well, no wonder I have this issue here because, you know, in your third step there, you should have been doing this differently. Then when I get it, it'd be fine. So <laughs> when Bob does it that way, it's fine. You know, so you can find out there's all these variances and we're trying to uncover where are the variances that cause you know, the variances in process and variances in tasks that have an impact on the variances of products produced. Because the product is either good to go, good for its use, for its intended use, it's downstream customers using it, regulators are fine with everything, uh, but maybe we're not efficient here in my step of this process here. And that's what we're trying to work on without disrupting everything else. Because if everything else is fine, except we could be saving lots of money if we made our process more efficient. That's what we're trying to focus on and not try to disrupt everything else that we're doing. That's very helpful. And I'm just starting to read conducting performance-based instructional analysis. So I'll probably have another wave of questions for you soon, but I do appreciate that in aligning and architecting, you mentioned the importance of defining the tertiary audience, which if I understand correctly is, here's who we are not going yeah. to uh, you know, think from the perspective of. And I think that's important when we're looking at a performance problem without a clear understanding of where the problem lies. Um, but yeah, I, so that happened to me because I'd been through an entire project where some project steering team member, a high level member of management said at the very end of the project, how come we're not training so-and-so? I thought where they were included in this. Every single meeting, we mentioned who we were focusing on, but obviously this person was attending to other things in parallel, and we got short shrift. So the primary audience, yeah, we're going to, we're going after them. Whatever they need, we're going to give it to them. Everything that they need is my rule for primary target audience. Secondary target audiences are, yeah, there's other people who are going to get some of what they need, but we're not here to take care of all of their learning or training needs. We're here to focus on this process. So, and, and so that's the secondary target audience. Tertiary target audiences are those people who others might think, might guess, might assume that we're attending to their needs, but no, we're not. And so we're going to make a list of these are the jobs we are not attending to. They are closely related to the process we're focused on. And because processes are the this uh, amorphous kind of a thing here where nobody knows where does it begin, where does it end, what's it include, what's it not include, you know, there's, there's this mystique about processes. So somebody can rightly assume that, yeah, those two job titles are in there too, aren't they? Oh, they're not. What? You know, and so <clears throat> you're dealing with the fact that processes are are messy. 
very few organizations have defined processes um, and they are usually at the more critical things, you know, how do we pay people? You know, that process is ironed out and we make sure that nothing happens to that. And there's other key processes, part of our value chain, but it's all these supporting processes for the support functions that are, in my experience, they're not articulated, they're not defined. So we don't know what, we don't even know the names of those processes. We don't know what the steps are. We don't know what the measures are. We don't know how to manage them. They're happening nonetheless, but basically it's all kind of, you know, happenstance. This is perfect segue into the last question that I have, because um, you're bringing up the point that looking from the perspective of the process kind of strips away the fundamentals of, well, who is it that's engaging in this? And a lot of the work we do is focused on project management processes. So, um, for example, you know, a lot of the projects we engage with are implementations of systems that are supposed to support project management processes. And that's a very process driven environment. And we're often working downstream of more of a technically oriented consulting firm that's, um, you know, taking in requests. Um, mapping them out and is configuring um, some sort of tool, some sort of system that allows them to kind of streamline and put controls around those processes. Um, and then they're handing off to us to roll out some of the instruction related to that. And sometimes um, what we're receiving is basically a feature of a system that doesn't always have clear documentation as to who is it that's using this and how and why are they using it and what are the inputs and the outputs? Um, sometimes there's gaps in the documentation we receive um, and often they're building these features on an agile basis. So they're building them and releasing them um, without maybe a clear full map of all of the features that they're gonna release. And we're supposed to take those in real time and go and share them. And I'm just wondering if you've ever um, been in an environment like this and if you have any tips um, in, in that kind of environment. Uh, yes, I've, I've had this experience. So, uh, you know, what's what's agile is, you know, been done under many different names uh, in the past. But but so the, so, for example, I did work with a, a, a defense contractor. They built fighter aircraft, military warfare aircraft and um they had an integrated product development process, the Department of Defense forces on everybody. And it forced everybody to be more collaborative, <clears throat> to use teams. And so the whole thing was you looked at a big project and you figured out what are the teams and all that stuff. So your team needs to be working with that primary contractor or that upstream contractor and embed a spy into their efforts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that way, you have a heads up as to what's coming and what's changing. And so you're, the trick that you have is how to build something to be robust <clears throat> to future changes. Now, it only can be so robust to future changes that if, you know, if something major change, you know, you have to throw it away and start all over again. But you're trying to build something that basically is robust to the anticipatable uh, changes the features, how things work, uh, their size, whatever the, those things are. Um, and so you're learning that there's features, you know, you, you you need to figure out your architecture for your instruction needs to go back to the product itself and the user community. And you either create a blend of this out of the seven job titles, this first job title needs these five features, the second job title needs a different set. Um, excuse me, cold season is starting. Um, so when you're looking at the, you, if you focus in on the processes and, and and look at the the again people going across those, I, I you know that's kind of where you have to start. I'm not sure that I answered your question here because I'm coughing. No, that's all right. You did. And um, I was just kind of more lobbying a, a scenario out there and, and just curious to hear how you think about it. And I'm happy to say we do some of the things you're talking about, but there's always room for improvement. And um, 
I don't really have any other formal questions for you right now, Guy. I am going to continue reading your literature and probably will send some more. But I just had one more fun one. I was curious who's on your shirt. Oh, this is uh, this is my uh, key mentor, the late Gary Rumler. And this is a picture from probably back in the late 90s, maybe the early 2000s. He passed away in 2009, um, or excuse me, 2008. Um, and uh, I had the first day out of college in my first job in a learning and development organization, I was told that I was going to learn a derivative of a derivative of the Gary Rumler approach to instructional analysis or words like that. And I didn't know who he was. And this was in August of 79 and in April of 80, I met him at a conference. And the people that I had gone to work with were adherents to his approach to things, he and his business partner, Tom Gilbert. And so I was inundated with this performance orientation from day one on. And so he was the guy. And I got a chance to work with him on projects. Um, when I was at my in my second job at Motorola, he was a consultant. He was my consultant. I carried his pencils around. Um, and but but so it, th he's the person that shared with me the point to where I had written my first solo book in '99, and I was with him at reviewing the book because I said, you know, I put things in here that attributed back to you, and if you don't like that, I'll take you out. And uh, he said, uh, I asked him, how am I ever going to be able to repay you? And he said, he was writing at a, a whiteboard and he turned to me and he said, you can't. And then he went back to writing. And a couple of minutes later, he said, you know, you're going to have to do what I had to do. I couldn't pay my mentors back either. I had to pay it forward. So that's what I'm doing with you. That's what you need to do. That struck me because all the people that I knew in my professional home, my professional affiliation group, NSPI, now ISPI, were like that. They all shared. And that was part of the uh, help that you would get at a professional society. So people that are getting into this, they need to find themselves a group of people to network with. Well, that's all right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, and I really deeply admire the, the pay it forward mentality. And I promise you, I will look for opportunities to do the same. Please do so. And uh, when you have questions, uh, in the future, let me know and we can do another one of these then. Sounds great. Thank you so much for your time, Guy, and for being responsive and open with everything. You're most welcome, Jake. Thank you. Have a great day. You as well. Bye now. Bye.